Happy Monday to you. Happy Monday to you. Happy Monday, <clears throat> my friends. Happy Monday to you. How are you this morning? Yes, I have a frog in my throat again. It's that time of year, isn't it? Oh my goodness. Whatever is in the wind out there, it's making my voice absolutely crazy. All right, so I got our comments turned on now. Um, hey, make sure you are telling me what you're thankful for. I know Juliana and Colleen today are very thankful for their new swing set in the backyard because it's amazing, complete with a tunnel tube slide. Oh my goodness, who even has that in their backyard? That's amazing. I'm so excited for you girls. All right, so let's get started with chapel time. We got a lot to cover. Got to cover it quick. Miss Kim's got a doctor's appointment this morning. So we are going to get going with our pledges. Here we go. Make sure, prayer request, things you're thankful for, put them in the comments. Here we go. Attention, salute, pledge. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible with liberty and justice for all. Very good. All right. And here we have the Christian flag. Attention, salute, pledge. I pledge allegiance to the Christian flag and to the Savior for whose kingdom it stands. One Savior, crucified, risen, and coming again with life and liberty to all who believe. Good job, good job, good job. All right. And now for the Bible. The Bible. Here we go. You got you, you ready? <laughs> I forgot what I was doing. Attention, salute, pledge. I pledge allegiance to the Bible, God's holy word. I will make it a lamp unto my feet, a light unto my path, and will hide its words in my heart, that I may not sin against God. Get it on your shoulders. Here we go. The, <clears throat> clear your frogs out. The B I B L E. Yes, that's the book for me. I stand alone on the word of God. The B I B L E spells Bible. Good, good job, good job. All right, very good. I hope you're hearing me. Okay, that's why I keep looking, making sure things are working. All right, now let's move on to our days of the week. Days of the week. Days of the week. Days of the week, days of the week. There's Sunday and there's Monday. There's Tuesday and there's Wednesday. There's Thursday and there's Friday. There's even Saturday. Days of the week, days of the week, days of the week, days of the week, days of the week. Good job. So yesterday was Sunday because we all went to church, right? Oh boy, we've got some blanks to fill in today. So that means after we were together on the 12th, then there was the 13th. And yesterday was the 14th. So what does that mean today is? Good, the 15th. That's right, 13, 14, 15th. November 15th. Look, we're halfway through the month. And guess what happens next week? Thanksgiving. Thanksgiving. Yes, that's right. So next week's Thanksgiving. Now, you got to fix these guys. Because if yesterday was Sunday, that means today is... What is it? Monday. That's right. And then tomorrow is Tuesday. Still fall. Oh, let me see what the girl said about the weather. Hang on. Sunny and cool. Okay. So we need to change our cloudy to sunny. Sunny. Put the cloudy back over there. I'd a whole lot rather have sunny, hadn't you? I know I have. I don't like it when the sun shines. Woo. I need some sunshine. All right. Now, let's see. We've done our calendar. We've done our weather. Prayer focus. Our prayer focus today is going to be confession. See that? Confession. It says, <clears throat> read 1 John 1, 9. That's our focus scripture. Confess any idols in your life. Whoa that are competing for the affection of your heart. Do we have idols? We do. 
many people make idols of their homes and of their cars and of their money. Some of us are video games, right? Pray that God's kindness would lead us to repentance. Repent and turn away from our sin. Take time to repent of any personal sins like lying and pride and being selfish and complaining and grumbling. Ooh, you don't do that, do you? Ooh. Pray that we would be quick to obey the Holy Spirit as he leads us and convicts us throughout the day. So when we feel like we know we're doing something we shouldn't, um, that's the Holy Spirit convicting us. You know, maybe you get a funny feeling in your tummy or you feel like, oh, I really shouldn't do that. You know, that's that conviction it's talking about. And so when that happens, we need to repent and turn away. Turn away from those sins. Don't, don't keep falling back into the same sin. Repent and turn away from them. You know, don't, don't keep doing them. Mm. Repent and turn away. All right, so that's our prayer focus for the day. So get your hands up. Here we go. One little, two little, three little fingers. Four little, five little, six little fingers. Seven little, eight little, nine little fingers. Ten little fingers folded in prayer. Everybody bow your heads and close your eyes. Dear God, thank you so much for this day. Lord, thank you for how you always give us what we need. And Lord, I thank you today for the Holy Spirit. I thank you for how you do convict us when we're doing things that we shouldn't. And Lord, I pray that we will be ears and, and hearts and eyes wide open to recognize that conviction so we can repent and turn away. Lord, thank you for um, <clears throat> our chapel family. Thank you how we always get to come together and, and share in your word. Lord, bless this time as we look to your word this morning. Lord, be with us as we dig in and look at your scripture. And Lord, be with us as we read Narnia today. And may we see you shining all throughout the story that C.S. Lewis wrote. Lord, we love you and we thank you. Lord, um, and we ask that you bless this time. In Jesus' name, amen. All right. So, Tom the turkey time. Turkey time, turkey time. Did anybody give me anything other than the girl's swing set? Well, we're just going to go with swing set. How about we say swing set and blessings? Can we do that? I'm going to write it up here. Swing set. All right. It's swing set. Blessings. I am so thankful for all the things God has blessed me with. Juliana and Colleen, you got to remind me on Friday to pack up Tom the turkey because the kids want to see him in kids' worship. So, <clears throat> Tom is going to come with us to church on Sunday. All right, so we're going to put this right back here in this tail feather. Come on, Tom. Don't be stubborn. Take your feather, man. There it is. Can you see it? How cool is that? Swing set. Blessings. See right there? Looking good, Tom. Looking good, man. Looking much better than you did to start with. Filling in those tail feathers. It's pretty exciting. We have so much to be thankful for, don't we? We really do. All right. <clears throat> now let's turn our eyes to our Bible story. Bible story. And today, let's see. Are we still in Elijah today? Oh. Yeah, we are. We're talking about Baal. Ooh. Wow. Okay. So, get your Bibles and turn to 1 Kings chapter 18. 1 Kings chapter 18, verse 16. 1 Kings, 1st and 2nd Samuel, 1st and 2nd Kings. 1 Kings, big number 18. Big number 18. Here it is right here. And we're going to verse 16. Let's see. We're right down here. Oh, here we go. Obadiah. Here we go. Obadiah went to meet Ahab and told him. <clears throat> then Ahab went to meet Elijah. And when Ahab saw Elijah, Ahab said to him, Is that you, the one ruining Israel? What? What is that doing? He replied, I have not ruined Israel, but you and your father's family have, because you have abandoned the Lord's commands and followed the Baals. 
Oh, now summon all Israel to meet me at Count Mount Carmel, along with 450 prophets of Baal and the 400 prophets of Asherah who eat at Jezebel's table. Oh, Jezebel. Jezebel's not, not good. And Baal and, um, and Asherah, those were, those were false gods that Israel had turned away from God and started worshiping. Oh, boy. Wow. Mm. So Ahab summoned all the Israelites and gathered the prophets at Mount Carmel. Then Elijah approached all the people and said, How long will you waver between two opinions? If the Lord is God, follow him. But if Baal, follow him. But the people didn't answer him a word. Then Elijah said to the people, I am the only remaining prophet of the Lord, but Baal's prophets are 450 men. Let two bulls be given to us. They are to choose one bull for themselves, cut it into pieces, and place it on the wood, but not light the fire. I will prepare the other bull and place it on the wood, but not light the fire. Then you call on the name of your God, and I will call on the name of the Lord. The Lord who answers with fire, he is God. All the people answered, that's fine. Then Elijah said to the prophets of Baal, Since you are so numerous, choose yourselves one bull and prepare it first. Then call on the name of your God, but don't light the fire. So they took the bull and he gave, that he gave them, prepared it, and called on the name of Baal from morning until noon, saying, Baal, answer us. There was no sound. No one answered. Then they danced around the altar they had made. At noon, Elijah mocked them. He said, Shout loudly, for he's a God. Maybe he's thinking it over. Maybe he has wandered away. Or maybe he's on the road. Perhaps he's sleeping and will wake up. They shouted loudly and cut themselves with knives and spears and according to their custom until blood was gushing everywhere. It was just terrible. It was a terrible scene because they were counting on this God that wasn't answering because he won't move. All afternoon they kept on <clears throat> raving until the offering of the evening sacrifice. There was no sound. No one answered. No one paid attention. Then Elijah said to all the people, Come near me. So all the people approached him. Then he repaired the Lord's altar that had been torn down. Elijah took 12 stones, according to the number of the tribes of the sons of Jacob. Because remember, there's 12 tribes of Israel. Um, to whom the word of the Lord, uh, according to the number of the tribes of Jacob, yeah, and to whom the word of the Lord had come, saying, Israel will be your name. And he built the altar with the stones in the name of the Lord. Then he made a trench around the altar large enough to hold about four gallons. Next, he arranged the wood, cut the bull, placed it on the wood, and he said, Fill four water pots with water and pour it on the offering to be burned on the wood. Then he said a second time. <clears throat> and they did it at the same time. And then he said a third time. And they did it a third time. So the water ran all around the altar, even filling up the trenches. So... So not only was he saying we're gonna God's gonna light the fire, but now he's poured all this water on it, right? And when do wet things burn? Not usually. Listen to what happened. At the time <clears throat> for the offering, the evening sacrifice, the prophet Elijah approached the altar and said, Lord, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, today let it be known that you are God in Israel, and I am your servant, and that at your word I have done all these things. Answer me, Lord. Answer me so that these people will know that you, the Lord, are God and that you <clears throat> have turned their hearts back. Then the Lord's fire fell and consumed the burnt offering, the wood, the stones, the dust, and it licked up the water that was in the trench. When all the people saw it, they fell face down and said, The Lord, he is God. The Lord, he is God. Then Elijah ordered them, seize the prophets of Baal. Do not let one of them escape. So they seized them. And Elijah brought them down and, and took care of them. And so we're going to stop right there. So the, the, story, the, the title of our devotion is Baal Cannot Hear. It had not rained for three years, just as Elijah had said. And then Elijah went to King Ahab and told him to get the prophets of Baal and everybody else, bring them to Mount Carmel. <clears throat> Elijah told them, take a bull and put it on the altar of the wood, but do not light the fire, and I will do the same. And the God who answers by sending fire is the true God. The prophets of Baal spent all day 
They spent all day praying to their God. But at the end of the day, when Baal had not answered their prayers, Elijah said, come, come with me, gather around. He built an altar and dug a trench around it. And then he prepared the bull and laid it on the altar and told them to pour water all over it. So they drenched the altar until the water filled the trench. Elijah said, answer me, Lord, so that these people will know that you alone are God. When he had finished praying, God sent a fire that burnt up the sacrifice and the wood and the stones and even dried up all the water. See, because our God, our God is amazing. Our God is almighty. So then it says for our devotion, how should our lives be different from those of unbelievers? Imagine if players from two opposing teams wore the same colors. That would be confusing, wouldn't it? God wanted to make it clear that his people could not serve two gods. They needed to make up their minds whose side they were on. Um, Romans 12, 2 says, Do not conform any longer to the pattern of the world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. In other words, don't become like ungodly people of the world by fitting in so perfectly that no one would know that you are a Christian. Remember that you can't be on both sides. You have been chosen to be on the winning side. You are God's children. Hey, there's my sister Roy. Good morning. Good morning, Sister Roy. It's so nice to have you with us this morning. Um, our verse for today, jo uh, Joshua 24, 15 says, Choose for yourselves this day whom you will serve. But as for me and my household, we will serve the Lord. And you know, I have a plaque hanging in my kitchen as a reminder of that. Because me and my house, we're going to serve the Lord. You know, the Bible says we can't serve two masters. We have to choose. Are we going to serve God? Are we going to choose God? Are we going to choose things of the world or fake gods like the Israelites had chosen? Um, and, he, oh, and he showed them. He showed them. <laughs> they prayed all day calling out to their God. That God didn't answer because that God's not real. But then when Elijah called out to our one true God, God is so awesome and so powerful. He answered and he burnt up everything there, even dried up all that water that they poured on there and poured in those trenches. Dried it right up because our God is faithful and our God is almighty and our God is powerful and our God is the one true God. Oh, what a great story. What a great story about God's faithfulness and how he answers us when we call upon his name. You know, I wish more people were calling upon his name today. I wish, I it is my wish and my hope and my prayer that people all over this world will come to know him and will call upon his name and trust him to do things like start that fire and burn it all up because just like Elijah asked him to. Wow, and God was able to show the people that he was the one true God. And then you, you, do you remember what it said? They all fell face down and called upon his name because they knew, they knew they had seen him work. They had seen him work. And you know what? If we would open our eyes today and look all around us, we would see all the work that he's doing. We would, if we would just pay attention. Hey, Miss Linda, good morning. Thanks for coming this morning. All right, so what a great story, right? Now, remember, you can go back and read that with your family. Um, that was 1 Kings, let's see, where were we? 1 Kings chapter 18, verse, I think it started at verse, what, uh, 16 or 18? Yeah, so, yeah, 16 is where we started. So read that whole chapter, chapter 18, chapter 18, 1 Kings. Wow, great story. Isn't it great that Elijah trusted him that way? You know, because <clears throat> he had no doubt that when he called on God, that God was going to do what he, what he was supposed to do, what he asked him to do, so that all the people could see and turn away from those false gods. You know, we make idols of things, just like they had made an idol of Baal. Uh, We make idols of earthly things. We need to repent and turn away from them and put our focus on God because he's the one that's the most important. All right, so are you ready for some Narnia? You ready for some Narnia now? Okay, let's see. Chapter 6, here we go. Into the forest. 
I wish the McCready would hurry up and take all these people away, said Susan presently. I'm getting horribly cramped. And what a filthy smell of camphor, said Edmund. I expect the pocket of these coats are full of it, said Susan, to keep away the moths, of course. There's something sticky into my back, said Peter. And isn't it cold, said Susan. Now that you mention it, it is cold, said Peter. And hang it all, it's wet too. What's the matter with this place? I'm sitting on something wet. I'm getting wetter every minute. He struggled to his feet. Now remember, they had all jumped in the wardrobe to hide. When we finished our last chapter, they're all in the, the wardrobe. Let's get out, said Edmund. They've gone. Oh, said Susan suddenly. And everyone asked her what was the matter. I'm sitting against a tree, said Susan. And look, it's getting white over there. By Jovi, you're right, said Peter. And look, there and there. It's trees all around. And this wet stuff, it's snow. Why, I do believe, do believe we've got into Lucy's wood after all. And now there was no mistaking it, and all four children stood blinking in the daylight of a wintry day. Behind them were coats hanging on pegs. In front of them were snow-covered trees. I apologize for not believing you, he said. I'm sorry. Will you shake hands? Of course, said Lucy, and did. And now, said Susan, what do we do next? Do, said Peter. Why, go and explore the wood, of course. Ugh, said Susan, stamping her feet. It's pretty cold, and about putting on some of those coats. Well, they're not ours, said Peter, doubtfully. Well, I'm sure nobody would mind, said Susan. It isn't as if we wanted to take them out of the house. We shan't take them even out of the wardrobe. I never thought of that, Sue, said Peter. Of course. Now you put it that way, I see. No one could say you had bagged a coat as long as you leave it in the wardrobe where you found it. And I suppose this whole country is in the wardrobe. They immediately carried out Susan's very sensible plan. The coats were rather too big for them, so they came down to their heels and looked more like royal robes than coats when they had put them on. But they all felt a good deal warmer, and each thought the others looked better in their new get-ups and more suitable for the landscape. We can pretend we are Arctic explorers, said Lucy. This is going to be exciting, even exciting enough without pretending, said Peter, as he began leading the way forward into the forest. Oh, there were heavy, darkish clouds overhead, and it looked as if there might be snow before night. I say, began Edmund presently, oughtn't we to be bearing a bit more to the left, that is, if we are aiming for the lamp post? He had forgotten for the moment that he <clears throat> must pretend never have been in the wood before. The moment the words were out of his mouth, he realized what he had, that he had given himself away. Everyone stopped. Everyone stared at him. Peter whistled. So, oh, sorry. So, you really were here, he said. That time Lou said she'd met you in here, and you made out she was telling lies. There was dead silence. Well, of all the poisonous little beast, said Peter, and he shrugged his shoulders and said no more. There seemed indeed <clears throat> no more to say, and presently the four resumed their journey, but Edmund was saying something to himself. I'll pay you all out of this, you pack of stuck-up, self-satisfied pigs. Where are we going, said Susan, chiefly for the sake of changing the subject. I think Lou ought to be the leader, said Peter. Goodness knows she deserves it. Where will you take us, Lou? What about going to see Mr. Tumnus, said Lucy. He's the nice fawn I told you about. Everyone agreed to this, and off they went, walking briskly and stamping their feet. Lucy proved a good leader. At first she wondered whether she would be able to find the way, but she recognized an odd-looking tree on one place and a stump in another, 
and brought them on to where the ground became uneven and into <clears throat> the little valley and at last to the very door of Mr. Thomas's cave. Oh, but there was a terrible surprise awaiting them. The door had been wrenched off its hinges and broken to bits. Inside, the cave was dark and cold and had the damp feel and smell of a place that had not been lived in for several days. Snow had drifted in from the doorway and was heaped on the floor, mixed with something black, which turned out to be charred sticks and ashes from the fire. Someone had apparently flung it about the room and then stamped it out. The crockery lay smashed on the floor, and the picture of the phone's father had been slashed into shreds with a knife. Oh, no. This is a pretty good washout, said Edmund. Not much good coming here. What is this, said Peter, stooping down. He had just noticed a piece of paper which had been nailed through the carpet to the floor. Is there anything written on it, asked Susan. Yes, I think there is, said Peter. But I can't read it <clears throat> in this light. Let's get out into the open air. They all went out into the daylight and crowded around Peter as he read the following words. The former occupant of these premises, the Fawn Tumnus, is under arrest and awaiting his trial on a charge of high treason against her Imperial Majesty Jadis, Queen of Narnia, um, Chatelaine of Care Paravel, Empress of the Lone Islands, etc. Also of comforting her, said Majesty's enemies, harboring spies and fraternizing with humans. Sign, Malgrim, Captain of the Secret Police. Long live the Queen. Here's how it was written. You see that? Long live the queen. The children stared at each other. I don't know what I'm going... I don't know that I'm going to like this place after all, said Susan. Who is the queen, Lou? said Peter. Do you know anything about her? She isn't a real queen at all, answered Lucy. She's a horrible witch. The, the white witch. Everyone, all the wood people, hate her. She has made an enchantment over the whole country so that it is always winter here and never Christmas. I, I wonder if there's any point in going on, said Susan. I mean, it doesn't seem particularly safe here and it looks as if it won't be much fun either and it's getting colder every minute and we've brought nothing to eat. What about just going home? Oh, but we can't, we can't, said Lucy suddenly. Don't you see? We can't just go home. Not after this. It is all on my account that the poor fawn has got into trouble. He hid me from the witch and showed me the way back. And that's what it means by comforting the witch, the queen's enemies and fraternizing with humans. We simply must try to rescue him. A lot we could do, said Edmund, when we haven't even got anything to eat. Shut up, you, said Peter, who was still very angry with Edmund. What do you think, Susan? I have a hard feeling that Lou is right, said Susan. I don't want to go a step further, and I wish we'd never come. But I think we must try to do something for Mr. whatever his name is. I mean, the fawn. That's what I feel too, said Peter. I'm worried about having no food with us. I'd vote for going back and getting something from the, from the larder, only there doesn't seem to be any certainty of getting into this country again when we when once you've got out of it. I think we'll have to go on. So do I, said both the girls. If only we knew where the poor chap was imprisoned, said Peter. Oh, they were all still wondering what to do next when Lucy said, Look, there's a robin with such a red breast. It's the first, burst, first bird I've seen here. I say, I wonder, can birds talk in Narnia? It almost looks as if it wanted to say something to us. Then she turned to the robin and said, Please, can you tell us where Tumnus the fawn has been taken to? As she said this, she took a step towards the bird. It at once flew away, but only as far as the next tree. Then it perched and looked at them very hard as if it understood all that they had been saying. 
Almost without noticing that they had done so, the four children went a step or two nearer to it. At this, the robin flew away again to the next tree and once more looked at them very hard. You couldn't have found a robber with a robin with a redder breast or a brighter eye. Do you know, said Lucy, I really believe he means for us to follow him. I've an idea he does, said Susan. What do you think, Peter? Well, we might as well try it, said Peter. The robin appeared to understand the matter thoroughly. It kept going from tree to tree, always a few yards ahead of them, but always so near that they could easily follow it. In this way, it led them on slightly downhill. Whenever, <clears throat> wherever the robin alighted, a little shower of snow would fall off the branch. Presently, the clouds parted overhead, and the winter sun came out, and all the snow around them grew dazzling bright. They had been traveling in this way for about half an hour, with the two girls in front, when Edmund said to Peter, if you're, still, if you're not still too high and mighty to talk to me, I've something to say which you might better listen to. What is it? asked Peter. Hush, not so loud, said Edmund. There's no good frightening the girls. But have you realized what we're doing? What? said Peter, lowering his voice to a whisper. We're following a guide we know nothing about. How do you know which side that bird is on? Why shouldn't it be leading us into a trap? Well, that's a nasty idea. Still, a robin, you know. They're good birds in all the stories that I've read. I'm sure a robin wouldn't be on the wrong side. If it comes to that, which is the right side, how do we know that the fawns are in the right and the queen, yes, I know we've been told she's a witch, is in the wrong? We don't really know anything about either. The fawn saved Lucy. He said he did, but how do we know? And there's another thing, too. Has anyone the least idea of the way home from here? Great Scott, said Peter. I hadn't thought of that. And no chance of dinner, either, said Edmund. And that is the end of chapter six. So you will have to come back to me on Wednesday for our chapel for chapter seven, which is called A Day with the Beavers. Oh timer's going off. All right, guys, that's it for today. Oh my goodness. I wonder what's going to happen next. I wonder what's going to happen next. Uh-oh. Were we having some technical difficulties? Oh. Oh, I'm, I'm sorry about that, Miss Linda. I see now. Yes, mine keeps interrupting too. I don't know what's happening. Um, but maybe the video when I post it on the blog will be better. All right, guys, have a great day. I love you guys. I'll see you right back here on Wednesday morning for more Bible study and more Narnia. Have a great day. Bye, guys. <laughs>